I'm Nicholas Penrake and you're listening to A Trader's Life, the podcast where I get to talk to successful traders about their approach to trading, how they started out and went from broke or breaking even to pulling in thousands of dollars a week. Trading is a tough game. They say only around 5% of those who try actually make a profit. Join me for A Trader's Life to glean some valuable insights from the market wizards I get to talk to. I have with me on the show today a man who says retail trading is a shambles. How does he know? Well, he's worked for major investment banks as a trader since 1994. If you want to get some insight into how the big guns work, stick around because Paul is happy to tell you. Hey, Paul, how's it going? Yeah, not too bad at all, buddy. Thanks, Nick. Thanks for having me on. Um, yeah. Hope the uh, your listeners here find something that's uh, quite informative. Um, probably not going to be sort of something that you've heard of uh, really in the past. Um, institutional trading is in itself a completely different animal to retail trading, um, and hopefully we can sort of lift the lid on the differences between um, some of the pitfalls that you can avoid. Um, and, you know, any other topics that you want to discuss, you know, buddy, you just ask away and I will try and answer as um, as best and as honestly as I can. Yeah, good. Uh, well, let's start at the beginning, more or less, or at least in terms of trading. How, how did you get into trading? Um, well, my dad worked um, on the London Metal Exchange, uh, which is the last open outcry market left in Europe. Um, he was there for around about 35 years. Um, you know, he started off as a young guy and obviously worked his way up to, you know, being the boss of the desk and things like that. Um, so I kind of, you know, was essentially born into it. Um, I mean, at the age of 16, I just left school and, you know, dad being dad, what are you going to do with the rest of your life? no bloody idea i've just left school um so he basically said to me look you're going to come and work with me uh for me um not going to get paid you know but i will get you you know some suits and shirts and ties you know and, and the likes uh, and you can come and get some you know sort of work experience um went there to be honest first day was complete chaos you know there's 500 people shouting and screaming in a language that i didn't understand obviously you know the markets have terminology and the first day i didn't have a bloody clue what any of it was um yeah it was you know a, a baptism of fire really yeah um but did it give you a thrill it, it, it did it did it was it's one of those things where you know as you got a little bit older you just kind of said to yourself Wow, I'm doing a job that there's like a really sort of small select um, group of people around the planet. Um, but what we do is, you know, it's very important in terms of, you know, I mean, back then it was metals, you know, very important in terms of setting prices um, for the rest of the planet. Uh, within which, they, you know, that they would be buying and selling, you know, their own metal, whether it be, a, you know, a scrap dealer or somebody, you know, making uh, scaffolding or something like that. You know, everything that we traded um essentially you'd look around and say well you know basically all of the metal that i see if it's non-ferrous metals uh all the metal that i see has basically been traded on the trading floor um yeah you yeah know, that's all the copper copper pipes in your house or you know or in your phones in your in, you know in your laptops and your computers everything like that you know you know and you thought yeah pff, you know what this is this is kind of a crazy job um <laughs> And, yeah, but awesome. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, yeah. you know, sometimes you'd, you'd walk out of the trading floor and it had been a particularly busy day. You know, your, 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 your brain's dumped, a, you know, a ton of adrenaline into you. And, you know, but the bell goes at five o'clock and that's it. Everything's over. Uh, so either go home, go to the pub or go back to the office. Um, and, you so know, it's you mostly walk, down to the pub, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> mostly down to the pub, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, mostly down to the pub. We've got to get rid of that adrenaline, to be perfectly well, yes, honest. Well, yes, that's, that's so true. Yeah. yeah. Gosh. Yeah. yeah. But, I mean, you'd walk out the trading floor and you'd just be walking down the road and, you know, you'd all these, other, you know, hundreds of people passing you by and stuff like that. And you'd just say to yourself, you've got no idea what kind of day I've had. It's, it's very strange, you know, if you've got accountants and secretaries and all people like that and, you know, they're all doing, you know, some completely different jobs to you. But, yeah, you know, yeah. It was... It was um, a very surreal. different world, yeah. Yeah, totally yeah. different world and sometimes very surreal, you know. Um, right. Yeah. Can you think of one one example where, where surreal fits really well? Yeah, massively. Um, yeah, massively. We had there was a big um, scandal 
uh, basically back in the mid 90s um, in the copper market, it was being manipulated um, by a trader for Sumitomo Bank. Um, his name was uh, Yasu Hamanaka, who was the head copper trader for Sumitomo Bank, Japanese bank. Um, and at any one time, he controlled uh, around about 5% of the world's copper reserves. Um, well, not reserves, but you know, in LME warehouses, London Metal Exchange warehouses. Um, he had a very, very big influence in the Far East um, with regards to copper. Um, but he had been fiddling the markets over a number of years. Um, and so one uh, very early morning, uh, we get a phone call from my dad's uh, Japanese office. Um, you know, not a usual occurrence to get a four o'clock phone call. Yeah. And so we both went downstairs and played back the message and it was Hamanak has been sacked. Uh, you know, things could get a little bit tasty in the morning. Um, and so that morning I was supposed to go and do my exams, um, which was the FSA exam back then, it's the FCA now, uh, which would have basically allowed me to start to talk to clients. So I was only still a young guy then. Um, and you, so, you know, you had to pass these exams in order to you know, sort of progress your career. Yeah. Anyway, so I said to Dad, you know, look, do you think it might be an idea if I actually go into the office this morning rather than go and do my exams? He said, yeah, I think they're going to probably need, you know, as, as, as many bodies as possible. So I arrived at the office uh, around about 7.30 in the morning and it was kind of like the calm before the sea, the calm before the storm, sorry. And it was like a little bit eerie. And then, you know, kind of the market was just about getting ready to open at eight o'clock. And then all hell broke loose. Um, that was when we were up in the, basically what we call the pre-market. So this is us, we're sitting on the, you know, at our desks. The metal exchange itself opened uh, at around about 11.30 in the morning, which is basically when we would all pile down, uh, you know, go to our booths, go to our offices and, and stuff on the trading floor. Um, and I remember the, ver the, you know, the first copper ring of the morning. Um, I was giving a commentary back to our office uh, and New York office and customers could, you know, clients could dial in as well and listen to the commentary that I was giving. And I'll never forget it. I just said, right, hold on to your hats, ladies and gentlemen. I think this is going to get a little bit busy. And my God, it was pandemonium all day. I mean, we basically started, copper was trading at around about $3,000 a tonne in the morning. And by the time we'd finished that day, it basically halved in value. Yeah. Never God. seen, yeah, never seen, and this is just a tonne of copper, you know, never yeah, seen, yeah. um, a market so crazy. Um, mm. I remember that at one point, uh, one of the senior traders um, where I was working, uh, one of my dad's very good friends, um, he actually stood up and told everybody to just shut up because <laughs> it's, it's just ridiculous. You know, now yeah. you can hear anybody. Right. You know, it was just a complete, I mean, never to be seen again. You know, mm. and certainly, you know, never ever saw anything like that again. It was just yeah. nuts. Um, he told everybody to shut up and just said, right, what do you want to do? What do you want to do? And what do you want to do? And what do you want to do? Because what we had then, um, and still the same now, is on the metal exchange, you basically, you're trading metals in five-minute bursts. You have two sessions in the morning, two sessions in the afternoon. But we also had um, a time which we called the curb when we traded all the metals all at exactly the same time. Okay. So the copper market's going mad. Everybody's going mad. And it was it literally just was pandemonium because nobody yeah, yeah. could understand what each other was saying, you know, and, you know, volumes and, yeah. uh, you know, volumes and prices. And you know, it was just so noisy. So, you know, we just had to just basically just calm down and chill out. Um, I don't think anybody went out for lunch that day, which again was a massively rare occurrence. Um, mm. You know, nobody went to the pub or anything like that. It was kind of all hands to the pump. And, yeah, yeah, you could you just kind of walked out of there that afternoon, <laughs> early evening, in a daze. Yeah, yeah, like after a battle or something. Yeah, exactly. You know, yeah. Been punched in the head by Mike Tyson. You know, it was. Yeah, it was yeah. just absolutely bananas. Um, yeah. Did it carry on into the week, or did it calm down a lot? Within it, well, a I day think, or so. Yeah, I mean, it's, it was still busy, um, but it did kind of calm down a bit. Um, you know, then things sort of started to unravel. 
um, the, the company that I worked for, uh, which was Credit Lyonnais, and you can go and look this up on the internet, anybody that's interested. Um, we were one of the parties that um, he was clearing a lot of his business through. So we were very much under the microscope. So we had the BBC, ITV, Sky, you know, all of these. Yeah. News, they were all outside the building and stuff like that. And we were told in no uncertain terms we were allowed to talk to them. Right, um, yeah. You know, so you go out. I mean, that was surreal as well. You go out, you've got all these bloody journalists and camera crews, you know, trying to jump on top of you and stuff like that. Um, mm. Yeah, it was really weird. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, a, yeah. A, a crazy time. Um, yeah. But no, so you I mean, started, yeah. So you started in, in commodities, metals mainly, obviously. Um, yeah. And then moved on to Forex. Well, but well, we're, moved on to basically, I mean, well, there's two definitions of a trading floor. I think when people look at trading floors these days, they kind of just they just see a, an office. Um, for me, trading floor literally means you're not in the office; you're actually physically on a trading floor. Yeah. So, but the, by this time, you know, a little bit later on, I kind of was working for now a company called Sukden Financial, um, Sukden as we were known as then, Sukden Financial now. And I was employed by somebody that was essentially self-employed uh, to go and work with him, but under the you know the, the umbrella under the banner of of, uh, of Sugden. And you know he had a sort of variety of different clients. So some were trading base metal, some were trading precious metal, some were trading foreign exchange. Um, you know, and he just kind of you know, again, some what people have got to realise is you know all markets are traded in the same way. Uh, it's price and it's value. And yeah. that's what matters. And, um, you know, all of these weird and wonderful things that came into being in the mid 90s, you know, with computing power, um, you know, algorithms and all things like this, you know, being able to track things very, very closely on charts. You know, it was never anything that we used, um, you know, because it just came down to price and value. Um, so the FX market is traded under that same banner as a foreign, you know, as um Precious metals, which is the same as base metals, which is the same as oil, which is the same as stocks and shares. Price and value. One of the real major things I think that people forget when it comes to trading is how commerce actually works around the planet. Um, and that always has come down to price and value. It's you know, a very, very um, prevalent thing. But it's really strange when it comes to trading that people kind of take that hat off and put on this crazy hat and say right no the world is made up of chart patterns trend lines and the use of indicators and fibonacci levels and bollinger bands and bwap and this that and the other and it's just not that 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 is there there's analytical tools um within which you know banks produce reports that go out to clients which induce clients into trading um which is how banks make their money because they're not trading from the same places as they're telling their clients that this is where they're trading from. So, yeah, a little bit perhaps underhanded, but at the end of the day, business is business. The banks are in the business to make money. Um, you know, whether it's, you know, commercial banking or investment banking, the ultimate goal is to make money. Um, and, you know, you have to think of the end game at the end of the day. Um, you know, one of the real big pitfalls, you know, as we sort of discussed when we just had a little chat before, one of the real big pitfalls is, is that, you know, your broker also has to make money. That's a big thing for him. He has to make money. You know, if you're sitting at a desk at a bank, um, it's in the vested interest of the bank to show you how to make money, to make it as easy for you to make money, because the ultimate end game is to make as much money as possible. The end game for a retail broker is to also make as much money as possible. But how would you do that? You purposely miseducate people into doing the wrong things. So if you did that, then you've got nigh on a perfect business model where if you're if you have, you know, retail traders and they are, let's just say they took 10 trades, they got, you know, two right and eight wrong. I mean, what's the broker going to do? He's just going to trade against you all the time. He'll take the hit on the two knowing that, you you know, they're going to get, a, you know, a, a, a bigger percentage of you losing than you winning. And it's just one of the ways that they make money. But, you know, at the end of the day, you have to think about the end game. Yeah. You know, yeah, for it, sure. it's, it's, it's mad, you know. Have yeah. to really, really take a step back and think and not just get totally engrossed in what you're doing. Um, so this is why trading books, um, videos on YouTube, articles on Google, all of this kind of stuff 
you just have to literally just pick it up, throw it in the bin because it's not designed to ever make you any money. It's only designed to make the broker money. And of course, you know, you or don't the guru. Be, yeah. yeah, you don't want to be, you know, you know, you don't want to be their best mate, do you? You don't want to get a Christmas card. Dear Mr. Smith, thank you for being such a valued uh, client this year. Happy Christmas. P.S. Thanks very much for the 10 grand. Yeah. You know, yeah. you don't want yeah, to be exactly. on it. Yeah. 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 So what is trading really about from your experience? Get, talk us through whatever you can reveal as to your experience and seeing well, it from the inside. Yeah. I mean, what, again, what you've got to think about is, is, you know, everybody's taught that the market is chaotic, um, that it's completely uh, a zero sum game. I mean, that's just rubbish for a start. Um, people are taught that, you know, it's um, very difficult to make money, that some people will make it and other people won't. But basically what they're saying is, is, is that the market is unpredictable. Now, I would suggest that that is an absolute load of crap. Because if you don't have predictability in markets, how on earth is anybody going to make any money when they've got no idea where the market's going? So there has to be there has to be order amongst perceived chaos. Yeah. And so if I was to suggest to people that the banks have been using the same levels to trade from for decades, the only thing that changes about them is value over time, then you would start to see and start to understand that no, the market isn't random. There is a structure there, but it's hidden in plain sight. Right in front <laughs> yeah. Of you. yeah, it's hidden in plain sight. It's right in front of you. But this is the thing: if you have been directed to look for chart patterns, trend lines, this, that, and the other, you're, that, that's what you're focused on. You're not focused on price, and you're not focused on value. And again, that's where people fall down. And um, you know, when you trade, you want to get rid of bias. You don't want to be bullish or bearish. You know, the market doesn't know who you are, doesn't know what you think, doesn't know the analysis that you've done, and it certainly isn't going to move on the basis of analysis that you've done. You have no control over it. You have no influence over it. And quite frankly, you never will. So stop trying to fight against it. You know, you want to take things back, strip things away. You know, any indicators you got, throw them in the bin. You know, chart patterns that you're looking for. Let's be perfectly honest. If you can only tell me once a chart pattern's completed, what is the point? The horse has already bolted. If you could tell me when it was going to start, that would be fantastic. But you can't. So again, you have to throw that in the bin. Um, you know, it's you know so far and away from retail trading, uh, but it's far simpler. That's the thing. It's very very simple. I mean, as I was explaining to you, you know, a little bit earlier, you know. The London Metal Exchange opens when? 1877. So I'm just going to say, if you just took a biro pen, something that we take for granted every day in our lives, just a simple biro pen, if you'd have taken that back to 1877, what would their reaction have been? What the hell is this? This is like magic. <laughs> right? So going back then, I mean, you know, and the Metal Exchange is still going today. It's 2020. How on earth did that market grow to be the world's biggest non-ferrous metals market? How did those people trade? Well, it can't have been using what you know what as retail traders perceive markets. It can't have been using any of these techniques because they simply didn't exist. So it must have come down to price and value. And nothing's changed. Nothing's changed at all. The analytical world has changed. But, you know, an analyst is an analyst and a trader is a trader and they're in two totally separate departments within a bank. Yeah. So what should a what should a trader be looking for on charts and how far back should they? As keep? much history as possible. Um, yeah. You know, because again, you have to see the big picture. Um, you know, you, you never see, you know, what's coming if you're just focused on the, you know, the microcosm. If you're focused on very short-term time frames and stuff like this, you're never going to see what's coming. Um, and if you're standing in the way when, you know, that juggernaut's coming, mate, you're just going to get run over. But you, mm. the worst thing is you're not even going to understand why. Yeah. You know, it's, it, it's very much a case of, like I say, you know, if you are looking for the wrong things, and you're going to be doing that all the time, I mean, don't be surprised that, you know, you, you just you don't get the answers that you're looking for. Because you have to understand that, you know, from the retail trading side of things, you know, the the, uh, the odds have been against you 
since you even you know since you've opened up your first chart because if you don't understand the rules of a game you shouldn't really be engaging until you do you know which some people might find that a little bit arrogant but i've been doing this for 26 years so i kind of like to think i know my onions um you know it's a case of stepping back and just thinking end game you know there are people out there that do this for a living how do they do it you know what's different um yeah yeah price and value we're not interested in all of these weird and wonderful analysis techniques that's for the analysts to take care of you know produce yeah. reports and send out to clients we have absolutely zero interest in what they're doing um but i mean it's it, it's yeah it, it's just such a different world but like i say very very important that if you do not understand how these markets function and quite frankly you shouldn't be trading yeah, and I, I don't want that to come across as arrogant. I'm just trying to help people to just say, "Well, hold on, I've tried all these bloody things. None of them ever seem to work. Why? Because they're not based upon the reality of what's actually really happening in the market. Because it just comes down to price and value. And if you understand how institutions approach trading, um, then you're in a much better position. And I really don't want that to come across as arrogant or stuck up or whatever. It's just me." Basically. You've got the experience and you've seen it from, you know, from inside, yeah. as it were. So, yeah. yeah. So wh when did you decide to pull away from sort of working for institutions and, or, I don't know, maybe you still do to a certain extent, but you, you set up your own, your own uh, sort of mentoring program? Yeah. I mean, it, I, I mean, I left in 2009, um, you know, so, you know, financial crisis and all that. Um, yeah. Just decided that I'd had enough, really, uh, to be perfectly honest. Yeah. That, was another, that was another extremely busy time. In the financial crisis, you know, going through there was absolutely crazy. I mean, I often yeah. ask people as well, you know, during that financial crisis, I said to the, I say to them, you know, look, on the euro, what do you think the widest spread was that I saw on the euro during the financial crisis? People say 100 pips, people say 5 pips, 50 pips, or whatever. I say, no, it's half a pip. I go, what? Oh. How the hell does that work? Half a pip. Yeah. The widest spread you saw in the euro. Yeah. There's so much business going through, so, and I mean so much, that the price just, it, they can't widen. Yeah. You know? And with that, and, you know, going through that, and that was obviously the second bloody crisis that I've been through, um, you know, after the Sumitomo one, I just thought, you know what, I can't be bothered anymore. Yeah. Um, You know, I know what I'm doing. I might as well just go and do it for myself. So I did that and then kind of fell into teaching. It was never anything I sort of really um, ever set out to do. Yeah, yeah it's just set out to kind do. of fell into it. Yeah. yeah, kind of fell into it, but then found that, you know what, I actually enjoyed it. Um, yeah. And it, it's, you know, it, it's nice to be able to pass on knowledge. Um, you know, I'm not one that, you know, goes out and does advertising, this, that, and the other, you know, mail shops and bloody this, you know, whatever people do in yeah. advertising. I don't do anything like that. You know, I just, you know, I'm just on LinkedIn, have done a previous couple of podcasts, um, trying not to <laughs> say the same <laughs> things, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it, the response was really, really nice. You know, we've got quite a lot of people, you know, getting in contact just to say, thank you so much for just not spouting the same rubbish as everybody else. Uh, and for actually giving me something to really think about. It was and is such a lovely thing to put people on the right path yeah, um, and show them that you know you can do this properly, but you know now you know the rules of the game. It's a completely different animal, you know, yeah, yeah. A completely different animal, and you know it, it it is lovely for, um, you know, for people that not everybody stays in contact. You know, people are people, mate. At the end of the day, you know what it's like. You know, all right, John, we haven't seen each other for five years. Oh, we must go and have a beer, and then you don't see him for going another five years you know these things yeah. tend to happen um, yeah, yeah. so not everybody keeps in contact but no the ones that have it's just yeah it's just been a beautiful experience just to say you know you've made a difference and it's um it's nice but um, yeah yeah so how do, you, how do you do it do you do it in a small group or one-to-one -one? no how's it work one-to-one yeah. -one, exactly yeah. one-to-one -one. um i can only ever do it in a one-to-one -one situation i think because that's the best way that people learn yeah um because everybody learns at different paces uh, everybody's mind works in a different way um and it's you know it's, it's it's soaking up that information and then you know sort of putting it into practice but yeah always one to one 
because uh, at any point, if anybody doesn't understand something, you can always just say, I don't understand. Can you re- you know explain it again or use a different example? Of course, if you've got a video or a book or something that you're reading or you know something that you're watching, it doesn't matter how many times you go over it. If you didn't understand it in the first place, you're going to be sitting there saying to yourself, well, I didn't understand that. I'm 10 minutes down the line now. Am I really actually understanding what this person's saying to me now? Uh, probably not. Is it is it like once a week with somebody, uh, each, each student, for want of a better word? Yeah, I generally suggest a couple, um, a couple of sessions a week. Um, I think the brain needs time to assimilate the information that it's just been fed. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, I do it across 10 hours. So I would never do 10 hours straight with somebody because I just think, you know, they'd probably get bored of the sound of my voice after, you know, after a while. <laughs> well, I think, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. a bit sort of frying, yeah. Yeah, you know. Yeah, and take it, all the information. Yeah. And you just, you know, you wouldn't soak it all up. So, yeah, you know, I mean, I generally suggest you have one on a Monday, have one on a Wednesday or a Thursday and stuff like that, just so that the brain's got time to just, you know, take it in, compute, and then say, right, okay, I've understood that, let's move on. Um, yeah, so, and yeah. is that over the course of, I don't know, six weeks, ten yeah, weeks? Five or six, yeah, five or yeah. six weeks. Um, yeah. And, you know, by the time you sort of get to the end of it, um, people are in a position where they can go out and trade. I mean, it's, you know, 10 hours might not sound a lot in the beginning, but I mean, blimey, it's amazing how fast you can learn when you cut out all of the crap and actually focus on what you should be learning as opposed to what you shouldn't be learning. Um, and I've had many, yeah. many, many people that have come to me and said, you know, look, this just doesn't work, does it? I'm never going to make any money out of this. I just say, look, let's just sit down and, you know, let's just go through it, discuss. Um, you know, what it is that you've been doing as opposed to somebody like myself would be doing. Uh, let's just sit down and, and let's just think about it. I mean, I had one guy um, who messaged me a few years ago. I won't say his name, um, but he was a lovely guy to work with. Um, he was a big record producer back in the day, 90s and 2000s. Uh, yeah. Not short of a few quid. Uh, very candidly told me that over a 10-year period of trying to learn how to trade, uh, he'd spent over a hundred thousand um, pounds oh. on various courses, this, that, and the other. Wow! Um, and I said, "Well, how the hell did you find me?" You know, because I don't do any advertising or anything. Yeah. He said, "I'll be perfectly honest with you." He said, "Yesterday." He said, "Don't forget, I've been doing this ten years." He said, "Yesterday, I typed into Google that forex trading is bullshit." <laughs> and Brilliant. He, he said, "One of your LinkedIn articles came up." Right, yeah, nice yeah. got forex and bullshit in the title. Thanks to Google, it's a nice bit of free advertising. Um, he said, So I read through that, and he said, That's really, to be honest with you, the only thing that ever made sense in the last 10 years. So, I want you to basically teach me what you know. Um, and so we got down to you know the nitty gritty in the first session, got to the end of it, and I said, So, what do you think? So he said, You are a blank, blank, blank. <laughs> okay. I said, I, yeah. said, I said, brilliant. Yeah. Why? He said, well, like I said, I've been doing this 10 years and I've spent over 100 grand trying to learn how to trade. And he said, and in less than an hour, you've taken every single thing I thought to be true about the market and you've basically picked it up and thrown it in the bin. He said, that's crazy. That has been sitting in front of me for 10 years and I never noticed. Yeah. I never, ever noticed. And it's just changing people's perception. You know, for some people, it's going to be a real hard reset. Um, For other people, it will be like, you know, just that little epiphany moment, that little eureka moment where it's like, oh, oh, okay. Yeah, that actually makes a lot of sense. Price and value makes a lot of sense. Why? Because that's who you are. That's how you perceive the world. I gave you the, you know, the example in the chat that we had just prior to this, but, you know, any guys or girls or whatever, you know, out there, when you're showing your partner something that you wish to purchase or that they wish to purchase, right? Maybe you're on Amazon or whatever. Um, you point at the picture because this is the thing you want to buy. You point at the picture. Where's your partner look? Your partner looks at the price, immediately makes a snap decision in their mind. Well, that's cheap enough. Conversation can continue. Well, that's too expensive. Conversation over. And you do that in a millisecond. Why? Because that's what you've always done. That's how human beings perceive things in the world. It's a price. What's the value of this price? 
in comparison to the thing that you want to buy. And so if you apply that to markets as well, what you're going to find is, is that it makes sense. And people often say to me, oh, God, I can't believe how much sense this makes. It's like, well, it should do because this is what you do in your everyday life. But like I say, it's just very strange when it comes to trading that people forget that. That goes out of the way and all of this other rubbish just comes in and just clowns your judgment. And just can't stress enough, that is not how trading is done at all. How long did it take you to learn it from your mentors, I guess, for want of a better word? Well, I mean, on the metal exchange, you can't trade until you're 21. So, I mean, I started at the age of 16. Um, so basically started off there being a, a clerk on the trading floor, which is recording the traders' deals and stuff like that, you know, and making sure that, you know, everything's in order. Uh, yeah. You know, his positions are all, you know, correct and stuff like that. We had things called a card. You make sure that the card is all right. That's an accumulation of all of the, the open positions that you have, you know, all things like that. Um, but, yeah, I mean, sort of training really sort of started on day one. Um, you know, you then kind of progress along. You know, I mentioned I was going to go and do those exams. Eventually, you know, got round to doing those, which enabled me then to speak to clients, you know, the, you know, on the phone, trade on behalf of clients and, and things like that. And then, you know, again, the natural progression after that is, well, then you become a trader. Yeah. So, I mean, it was, it was always ongoing. You know, it, 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 it's not as if, you know, you go to a bank and they go, right, OK, sit down. We're going to send you on a trading course. And when you get to the end of the trading course, you know, you get this certificate or whatever. Uh, you know, you have your picture taken and everything like that. I mean, if that happened in any investment bank, God, the piss taking would be absolutely ridiculous. I mean, bad enough as it is. But I mean, that would just take it to a brand new height, you know. Yeah. Because, of course, things like that don't happen. And you get courses out there that say they're certified. Certified by who? Yeah. Right, certified by who? There is nobody out there, you know, um, that certifies trading courses. There's no regulatory body. I mean, that's a big thing. Any idiot, basically, um, that's watched a load of stuff on YouTube or or Google or read books or stuff like this, you know, they can go out there and proclaim that this is what happens at the banks and this is how the banks trade and blah, 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 blah. And of course, they've never worked there. How on earth are they supposed to, how are they supposed to teach you what happens when they've never had any of experience of it themselves? You know, so real life on the job education, like happens in any walk of life. You know, it's kind of like you, I don't know, you come out of university or college or school or whatever and you've passed all of these exams and then you go to work and on day one, you very quickly realise you know nothing. You know absolutely nothing about what you're doing. So you have to be taught. And for me, yeah, it was just literally you're picked so up. Osmosis, the, yeah. Yeah, you picked up. Yeah, 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 yeah. So what's, what's a typical day look like for you, Paul, you know, in terms of time Tip teaching, time trading, time um, listening to well, the news, reading well, the news? Yeah, I mean, we try not to watch the news these days because it's all just yeah, yeah, it's all isn't it? Yeah, yeah, we won't yeah. mention that. We won't mention that in the interview. I'm trying yeah, to put yeah. any behind us. Um, yeah. But a typical day, I don't know. Get up, have a look at the markets. Anything moved? Any trades kicked in? Yes, no, nothing's kicked in. Not an issue. I'm just going to wait. Um, you know, the great thing is these days, obviously, we've got, you know, smartphones and technology, you know, you can link various things in and it will tell you, you know, when your trades have opened. Time trading during the day, um, well, this isn't trading every day. No. Um, this is only trading when you get to particular levels. Yeah. So time spent in front of a screen is actually very minimal. Because if the market is not where you want it to be, then you have absolutely zero interest in trading it. Um, again, I think so many people fall foul of just sitting in front of screens all day, you know, yeah. and trying to analyze and overanalyze and micromanage. And do you know what I mean? The, the, the problem yeah. is, you know, trading is not like real life. You know, real life is the more hours you work, the harder you work, you get, you know, better pay. Doesn't work with trading. You know, the more you trade, your broker's just sitting there rubbing his hands. Yeah, yeah, you know, exposing more, yourself more, yeah. Yeah, right. So you don't want to be doing that. You want to be very selective in what you're doing. Um, 
which means that, yeah, you're not trading every day because not every day is a trading day anyway. Um, you know, in terms of news and things like that. Um, you know, we want to essentially really avoid the news as much as we can um, because the banks aren't trading it. Yeah. What, what, give us like one example of a sort of tip-off that makes you think, oh, right, that could be a good day to trade. A bit well, of news, something from the banks, for example. Yeah, I mean, it, it, that's the thing. You know, if you're looking at the news, you're looking at fundamentals, you're understanding, you know, you know why essentially a market is moving. You're not going to know when is the day to trade. That's the thing. That's market dependent. That's not down to you. You can't influence, you know, where you want the market to go. So the way in which I teach people, obviously, which I showed you earlier, um, and what my charts look like. <clears throat> so I have a roadmap. And my roadmap tells me where I want to trade from before the market actually gets there. And I want to trade from that level. Why? Well, because I've gone back over, you know, decades worth of data. And I've said to myself, right, this is where I can see that the major movements have come from. And it always seems to keep coming from the same places. The only thing that changes about this is the value. So that's where I want to trade from. And so, like I say, you know, it, if the market is where I want it to be, trade. If it isn't, I'm not interested. Yeah. Um, you know, it's but, important, important, isn't it? I mean, a lot of making money on as a trader is is about knowing when not to trade as yes. much as when to trade. Yes, very much yeah. so. I, I think a lot of people get frustrated because they're you know they're kind of sold sold a dream that essentially turns into a nightmare. Then they start getting <laughs> yeah. really really emotional about it. Yeah. Um, you know, bias comes in, emotions come in. Um, you know, you're always trying to chase a loss. At the end of the day, you have to just sit there and compartmentalize it as much as you can. You say, right, well, I took that training, didn't work. Okay, fair enough. Doesn't mean I'm going to go and jump into another one straight away. Why? Because well, you're all over the place mentally. Yeah. You know, you've got essentially, really, you've got to. You're just reacting, basically, aren't you? Yeah. You're reacting and you're reacting to something, again, that you can't control. I mean, you know, I gave you a, a, a great example of that. You know, let's just imagine John Smith at number three of Casey New Avenue, right? He's, he's never heard of supply and demand trading. You know, price and value are not something that really sort of enters into his mindset because he's been taught chart patterns, trend lines, and indicators. Yeah. Um, you know, so he's been sitting there for a couple of hours, and he's up and down on the charts, and he says to himself, right, boom, that's where I'm going to buy the euro. And so he sits there and he waits, and it comes down to that level when he's in. And you say, okay, Johnson, why did you buy there? Because the market's going to go up. How do you know? Well, I did the analysis. Yeah, but you do know the market doesn't know who you are. It doesn't know what you think. And it doesn't know where you want the market to go. Yeah, but it's going to go up. Okay, John, good luck with that. <laughs> so he buys, and then the market doesn't go up. It, it drops. And he thinks to himself, well, all right, look, it's only me. I am only John Smith. I am a retail trader. Maybe I got my entry slightly wrong. What I should be doing here is I should be buying again. Um, I'll get a better average price. And when the market goes up, how do you know it's going up, John? I did the analysis. Yeah, but you do realize, yeah, shut up. It's going up. So he buys again. And of course, it doesn't go up. It goes down. And at that point, he says to himself, right, we'd be an absolute idiot not to buy here. So he buys again. And it keeps going down. Yeah, I'll make, <laughs> yeah. I'll make triple the profit, right? Yeah. I'll make triple the profit. I'll get a much better average price. Right. John, how do you know the market's going up? Because I did the analysis. Yeah, but you do realize I don't want to hear it. The market's going up. But he doesn't. It goes down. So at this point, he's now sitting there thinking, crap, I've got three trades. They're all going offside. Right. First thing, delete, delete, delete. Delete all the stop losses, right? Delete the stop losses. And pray, <laughs> right, yeah. pray that that oh, market yeah. doesn't keep going down and you blow your account up. Yeah. That it will go up and you can actually get back out for break even. Thing is, he has no concept of why that market's going down. Price and value. The people that set the valuations, i.e. the institutions, have made a decision that that particular, you know, currency, commodity or whatever, is now overvalued. Yeah, now it's overvalued. We want to sell it because we think it's expensive. Yeah. So he's sitting there thinking to himself, well, what the hell? Why is this happening to me? 
Why does this keep happening to me? Because he doesn't understand the rules of the game. He's not heard of levels that have been traded for decades. He's not really incorporating price and value into his trading. He's gone down the route of becoming an analyst. And of course, if an analyst isn't a trader, what the hell is the point in using analysis techniques to discover something that's already happened that you can't do anything about? Yeah. So, it's a bit like hindsight, isn't it? You know, yeah. everything's clear then. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. good old Harry hindsight, he always makes money. Yeah. <laughs> if only I would have done that there. If only I would have done that there. But I mean, you know, again, using all of this stuff on a chart, if you're flicking through different time frames, all the information changes. So which one is it that you should be following? If it says on my hourly chart, I should be selling, but it says on my daily chart, I should be buying. What one are you supposed to do? And, and do you mostly use um, the bigger time frames? It sounds like you do monthly, uh, weekly and daily. Basically, just, you know, just looking at as much data as possible to understand what that chart is actually telling you and just understanding as well what a chart actually is. It's just a graphical representation of human interaction in a particular market over a course of many years. That's yeah. all it is, right? So if you can understand the story that is being told to you on the chart, like a language, once you can decode that and you can really notice on a chart where the same things have been occurring time and time and time and time again, that's where you want to be trading from. Yeah. Right? So yeah, yeah. time itself, really, as a concept, doesn't really come into it. It's like, right, where can I see interaction at particular prices? doesn't matter when it happened. It's the fact that it did happen. And the fact that it keeps happening from the same places over and over and over and over again. Yeah. Yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah. Yeah. So time as a concept, not really something that I would, you know, sort of think about. Like, you know, when we read through the chart earlier, so that's what I said. This is a timeline. I'm looking for interaction. I don't care if it happened in, you know, 1986. 1997, 2006, 2020. It doesn't, that makes no odds. It's just right. This price here, how many times have we reached it? What's happened when we've reached it? Has it been repeated over decades? Yes. Right. That's where I want to trade from. I want to trade from anywhere else. Um, but again, when it comes to that, you know, people, you know, you stick a chart on a monthly chart and people go, what the hell are you looking at that for? There's so much else that's been going on. Did it change value? Yes or no? That's all I'm looking for. Yeah. You know, did it change value? Yes or no? Yeah, key recurring patterns. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, you know, it, it's unsubscribing from any forums or any brokerages or any, you know, things to do with trading. It's, it's just unsubscribe from me. Unsubscribe from YouTube. Stop reading trading books because they don't never mention price and value. Yeah, it's all about this is a double top, this is a double bottom, this is a shooting star, this is a pin bar, this is this and this is that. Rubbish. I've got no interest in the shape of candlesticks whatsoever. Imagine a world where candlesticks didn't exist. How on earth would people trade then? Because I certainly didn't use candlesticks when I was working at a bank. It's just a line on a chart. That's all it is. And it just shows me price. Yeah. Do you, I mean, do you look at candlesticks or do you turn everything around to a graph structure or, or some, well, a lot line? Yeah, I teach people on candlesticks. Really, the only reason I do that is because I think most people are very, very familiar with them. So they understand the concept of them. Yeah. And visually, when you look at it, it really helps to sort of understand what I go through, you know, sort of during the course. But I mean, after that, once you've got it and it's in your mind, you can just go, well, let's just have a look at it without candlesticks. Oh, could I trade that? Yeah, of course, a bloody could look. You know, yeah. this is where, you know this is where we are. So yeah, it's not you know, it's not you know, candlesticks aren't the be all and end all, but they do make it easy or easier, I should say. Um, yeah, for people to understand and process what it is that I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So how do people find you, Paul? I'm on LinkedIn. I do have a website which is paulscottfx.com. Please don't expect anything flash because that's not what you're going to find. Um, again, Paul Scott FX. Um, I'm on there. Like I say, I've done a couple of podcasts before, which you can find on the website. Um, you know, thank you very much for having me on this one. It's been, you know, lovely to be on. Email is, is paul at paulscottfx.com. 
Uh, also, if you go over to the website, I do have my phone number on there. Uh, so if anybody wants to get in contact, send me an email, get in, you know, chat over the phone or whatever, uh, please feel free. But just don't expect me to pull any punches because I don't, because let's be honest, the world's full of crap. What's the point in adding to the pile at the end of the day? Well, quite, yeah. No, it's refreshing. Well, thanks so much for being on the show, Paul. Uh, it's been very interesting. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, great to uh, touch base with you. Yeah. Okay. Okay, buddy. Well, just thanks to everybody out there for listening. If you made it towards the end, well done. Go and get yourself a beer and... Um, and then give me a call. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'll yeah. sit down and look yeah. at the charts and, just, and, 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 you know, try and decode what I've been saying. Exactly. All right. Nice one, Paul. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks ever so much. Cheers. Cheers. Bye-bye. I was talking just now to trader Paul Scott, and you've been listening to A Trader's Life. Thanks for joining us.